All right, guys? Yes. Here's Alex. All right. So, um, for all my seniors in the room, if you remember our senior class, like, opening meeting, Dr. Boyle didn't use a microphone. It was pretty sweet. So, I'm going to do the same thing. If I'm screaming at you or you feel like that, like, I'm sorry. I do use a mic if you want me to. But, um, yeah. So, first off, to start off, I think we should give a round of applause to Rohan and Melissa. Um, this. Um, I'm going to be honest, doing a TED talk has always been like, I don't want to say one of my like kind of sugar dreams, but you know, it's an opportunity that's really cool and thanks to these guys, you know, they make it really easy to do it. So if you're interested, look into it. So unlike Jane, I need my note cards. So I got them. I don't need a mic. But the scandal of college sports. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's like, you know, get ourselves active with this. So how many of you guys have been to a big time College football game, basketball game, volleyball's big, wrestling is growing. We got a lot of people in here. College, college sports are huge in America. We're, we're the only country that glorifies college sports, college sports as much as we do. So, all right. So, that's me, all right? I was a little kid. I loved Michigan. Both my parents went to Penn State, three out of four grandparents went there. Penn State's in my blood, but for whatever reason, there I am. I'm a Michigan fan. My dad took me out to Ann Arbor. We saw them play Ball State. Yeah. They killed them, but uh, it was exciting. And it was a great experience, and school spirit, and you know the athleticism, and like this huge stadium. It was all sweet. And as a little kid, you know, I looked up to that. I was like, wow, that'd be so cool to be in, like, a part of college sports. But as I've gotten older, I found myself, I'm looking at college sports and you know, seeing the difference between college sports and pro sports, between the talent, the advertising, um, and just pretty much you know, the money that's going into these sports, is, there isn't that much difference. So I'm going to tell you why college athletes should be paid. So to start off, in order to understand the, you know, the college athlete and the rules surrounding it, <coughs> you must first understand the NCAA, the NC2A, whatever you want to call it. Um, the NCAA it stands for the National uh, Collegiate, National Collegiate <laughs> Athletic Association, or as Brian Bosworth called it, the National Communist Against Athletes. <laughs> However you want to look at it. So, the NCAA started in 1906, but it didn't really come into prominence until the 1950s. So, before the 1950s, college athletics were small, but, and they were ridiculously corrupt. You had stories like at the University of Pitt, where underclassmen would go on strike because the upperclassmen were getting more benefits than the underclassmen. They were getting paid under the table, all that stuff. So in 1950, or 1956 to be exact, um, the uh, colleges decided to compensate the athletes by giving them free tuition. Sounds great. 1956, that was huge. And it was great. And, but there was still a lot of corruption. Between the rise in scholarships and the rise in TV deals, there's a lot of corruption, a lot of pretty much unfairness between schools. So yeah, this is uh, the University of Notre Dame, and them and Penn decided to get their own TV contracts with the rise in you know TV, and they made a lot of money off of this. But every single weekend, the only people that you could see was Penn or Notre Dame. So the other colleges, they're not excited about this. So what do they do? They go to the NCAA, and the NCAA decides, all right. We're going to get rid of Penn and Notre Dame. We're not going to let any of our colleges play against them. And you know, you can't have a TV deal without any games. So it just shows the NCAA's, you know, their their willingness to, you know, if you're not with us, then you're against us. So eventually Penn and Notre Dame decided to, you know, give in and the NCAA controls all the TV contracts with college athletes. So each year the college athlete, they must sign, it's like a little guy signing something. They, got, they must sign a code of amateurism stating, I will not accept any gifts, money, prizes. I won't sign for money, anything like that. You are an amateur. You do not get paid for playing sports. You are here as a student first, an athlete comes second. Now, amateurism started, a lot of people will they'll hear amateurism and they'll be like, oh, wow, that's awesome. That's like the Greek Olympics. No, not true. <laughs> Greek Olympians were given so many benefits. They were given... They, weren't, they didn't want to have to go to war. 
which is huge. Most men had to go to war back then. They were given women. <laughs> they love women. They love women. Um, they were given land. They were given all of these benefits for participating in the Olympics. So amateurism, the code and like the term really began in the 1950s when the bureaucrats of the United Kingdom, they're playing, you know, they're playing cricket, they're playing tennis, all those sports, and the poor people are wanting to get into it. So what do the rich guys do? I, like, they don't want to play with the poor people, you know. But, so what do they do? They create amateurism. It's just playing for fun. So it kept the poor people out, and the NCAA decided to, you know, use this and, you know, keep their athletes in line. Now, an amateur can be, it can be spread. Like, the term is so, like, elastic. It can be spread from, you know, me balling out at the Y, I'm just playing for fun, or it could be, uh, I'm trying to think of a college athlete right now. I'm blanking for whatever reason. Uh, give me a name. Deshaun. Braxton Miller, out there, throwing, <laughs> catching touchdowns, doing whatever on the college football field. So um, that's amateurism. You know, you play for free, you're there for, at, for school, and then you get to play athletics as well. Now, um, how the NCAA like, monitors this is that they control their eligibility. That's, that's uh, the code of the amateurs that they signed is only uh, worth for one year. So at the end of the year, if a, an athlete doesn't perform well, I mean, they can get their scholarship revoked. You know, that, that is not like a binding agreement. It can be revoked at any time. And it's only worth for one year. So what you'll see with the NCAA is that they will make these players out to be frauds and have questioned their character. So you're looking at guys like Reggie Bush, Cam Newton, guys that we see as terrible people because they decided to take money for, you know, playing, like, accepting pay for play. Now, what we have to remember when this is a huge deal on ESPN and I mean, it'll even hit, you know, CNN or big, big news like channels like that, none of this is illegal. All right, if I go to college to play a sport and I decide to take some money, that's not illegal. If I sign something and someone pays me for that, that is not illegal at all. They have every right to sign something and get paid for it but it's the NCAA that's cracking the whip, taking away their eligibility, and pretty much you know, taking away their ability to play in college. Now let's also not forget, the NCAA, they got big wads of cash. Last year, the NCAA brought in about a billion dollars in revenue. 81% of that being from TV deals, advertising, and things like that. Not you know, the necessities to put on a college, you know, college sports event. So next. The universities. It is said that students want sex, uh, faculty want parking, and alumni want football. Why do they want football so badly? Who cares about football? Well, first off, school spirit. Nothing better than, you know, going back to your school and seeing them play football and beating Old State, you know, winning the rivalry game. But also, football means money. So we're going to go back to those big wads of cash. Now, over under. Alabama football brought in $50 million in revenue last year. Over, under. Scream it out loud. Over. Over. You're all right. $81 million in revenue. <laughs> University of Texas. Over, under. $90 million in revenue. Over. Over. $103 million in revenue. <laughs> These are big money businesses. And I stress the word businesses because they are making multi-million dollar deals to, you know, get the advertising and all that stuff. Now, how does that relate back to the universities? Well, the universities, they're feeling all this pressure. You know, if they want, if they want money, they got to get these big athletes in. So what are they going to do with that? They're going to, well, most of these athletes are coming from underprivileged areas. They're not educated as well. So what do they do? They lower their academic standards to admit these better athletes and, you know, build up their football or basketball or anything like that, their program. So it is said, oh, I went back too, my bad. So those are the alumni. Big tailgating, everyone loves it. Should have gone to that slide. Anyway, graduating. That's why you're there. You're there to get a degree. But what we need to ask ourselves is, are these athletes really getting a proper degree? It's often says that C's get degrees. So you'll see in a lot of these schools that these athletes are getting exempt from classes and you know, not getting a serious education. So we all look at University of North Carolina. It's a great state school. I think it's top, top five in the country. But UNC was just recently there was a scandal that came out about these athletes that were taking paper classes. What's a paper class, you might be asking. Well, I'll tell you. 
A paper class is when you don't go to class, you just have, it's like an independent study here at Conestoga. You just write a paper at the end of each semester. Most of them are graded A or B, pass or fail, something like that. And you're accepted from classes. Um, so, yeah. So, I watched a documentary on this, and they interviewed a woman from UNC, actually. And she was discussing like, how like, the difficulties of being, of being a teacher at UNC, and she was an academic advisor. She was giving stories about these students that would come in, all athletes that would come in, they would be struggling with reading, writing, all the normal and, I don't want to say like the givens of going to college, but things that you would expect students to be prepared with in order to receive a, a true uh, degree. So, a lot of you might be thinking, well, that's the student's fault, you know? Like, why aren't they just like, going above and beyond and, you know, learning more and all that? But what we have to remember is that these students are there to play football. But they're there to, the, to play basketball. It's not the head of the business school that's knocking on their front door, sitting down with their parents and being like, I'm going to take care of your son for the next four years. I'm going to get him ready to go to the NFL or the NBA. All right? It's the football coach. Wait, what did I say? Yeah. It's the coaches. It's the coaches, yes. All right. <laughs> I, I, I was talking about that. So it's the coaches that, is get, that are getting these kids to go to school. It's not the academics. If you're a student and you're, you know, and you're being recruited and all that, to go to a school, your, your initial thought is that you're there to play a sport. The athletics come second, but by the NCAA, you are a student athlete. You're expected to be taking your academics as seriously as your sport, even though you're there on behalf of the sport. <coughs> Something to think about. Food for thought right there. So, going on. Commercial industry. This is where all the money is. So I've noticed that when I'm watching, you know, college preview show for the bowl games, I'll find myself saying the Tostitos Festival, like that's it, it's the Tostitos Festival or the Allstate Sugar Bowl. I find myself saying these things and forgetting Allstate is a company. That's not like, like they're sponsoring the bowl game. It's not, what am I saying here? The commercialization has become so normal that we don't even notice it. I don't even notice myself like saying that Tostitos is sponsoring these bowl games <laughs> because it's become so normal. When you're watching college athletics game, you're flooded with commercials at all times, whether you know it or not. And with the with the commercial industry, these kids, like these companies, are paying huge amounts of money to be able to, you know, sponsor these events and all that. So over under all state, 15 million dollars a year to get the all state sugar bowl. Over. Over! 18 million! <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, that's my only stat for that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Alright, here's another one. So now we also have to remember, why, why do they want to commercialize so much on these events? Well, first off, it's cheaper. You, know, you factor out all the payroll for the NCAA, because what's this NCAA's payroll? Gusek, Nilch, nothing. <laughs> Alright, they have the best payroll in sports, because why? They don't pay their players. So, over under, uh, 11 million viewers per game for the NCAA March Madness Tournament. Over. Over, 11.3. <laughs> so, these events have a huge amount, like a huge TV audience. And the market, and like, the pool to advertise on it is just limitless. Because what are the costs? It's nothing. So you look at a guy like, I don't know if any of you know the story of Sonny Vaccaro. Raise your hands. Who's seen the 30 for 30? Great 30 for 30. Nice. Well, we got like two hands in here. All right. I'll give you a brief background. Sonny Vaccaro is a little guy, works for Nike, and he got Nike into the college basketball business. How, you might be wondering. Because he ran a high school basketball tournament. He knows all the coaches, knows all the players. This is all going on in the 1970s. So what Nike decided to do is like, all right, let's think about this. We got a sport where the players don't need to be paid. There's a huge TV audience, and they are literally walking billboards for our pro product. What's stopping us from putting shoes on their feet, letting them run around, win a national championship? And why are they winning that national championship? Because they're wearing the new old school Nike basketball shoes, whatever those things are. So what Sonny Vaccaro did, he would go into each school, he would pay coaches thousands of dollars, just here are the shoes, if you want to wear them, fine. If not, that's great. Um, of course, most of the players wore them because they're sweet shoes. And um, there you go, Nike's into the college basketball industry. And the next step from there was just signing huge deals with 
the schools. So they're no longer just playing or paying the coaches, but they're also paying the universities. They have the bookstore. That was, Sonny Bakari stressed that like 30 times. You get the bookstore and you have the school and you have the entire market. Because after each tour, game, all that stuff, what are they wearing? The Nike product, the Nike shirt, hat, pants, underwear, I don't know, whatever you get at a school bookstore. So that is the commercial industry. All right, the athlete. We got Johnny Football. Jimmer Fredette. Who here, you're at the Y, you're balling out, you're shooting from half court. What do you, sh what do you scream? Kobe! Uh, Jimmer. <laughs> Jimmer, Jimmer. You, Jimmer. Sc you scream Jimmer! Why do you scream Jimmer? Because he shoots from way outside. He's a huge icon. Why is Johnny Football the man? Because he is the man. Money! Money! He, they, these guys are icons. They're sports icons, and they're bringing in their performance is bringing in huge sums of money for their schools. Now, I would love, I would love it if Johnny Football was there, you know, getting a business degree and playing football. It would be the most admirable thing ever. But what is Johnny Football doing at Texas A&M? He's playing football. Like he is there for football. It would, like most of these, most of the athletes at these big time football schools. They're not going to class as much, they're taking online classes. The quality of their degree is lesser, just because they're, the majority of their time is being taken up by these sports. You look at a college athlete's schedule day to day, they're getting up at like 5.30 in the morning, working out till 9, class till 1, meetings till 2, maybe a little bit of homework, then practice, then tutoring, then homework, and then wake up at 5.30 again. They are on a routine at all times. They're scheduled at all times because they're there to perform well for their school. So, my best example. You're looking at this guy. He's a mathematician. He's a genius. You, some, some of that length and breadth with the area. I don't know, whatever that says. So, you're looking at a college mathematician. And let's say this kid is brilliant. He goes to, all right, I gotta hurry this up. He goes to, let's say, Texas A&M. He creates this new equation. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to publish this work. I'm going to make my money's work. You know, do all that stuff. He does it. He makes a million. He's celebrated. He is, you know, the, I'm sure that the university would celebrate him, put like a part of a show for him, all that stuff. Because, you know, he's, he did great work. Now, let's say, that's my camera. Let's say that um, a college athlete decided to do that. He would be shot down. He'd be like Cam Newton. He'd be called Scam Newton. All that stuff. Why? Because simply because he wanted to get compensated for his, you know, his talents and all that. So what the NCAA is doing is that they're singling out a single small pool of students that can't be making, you know, money off of their off of their talents. You're looking at the president of the school at University of Kentucky making has is on full scholarship, and he's also compensated with five thousand dollars a year just for being the school president. Now, if that was Anthony Davis, you know, the NCAA would be up in arms about that just because he's an athlete. So, some of you may disagree with me. That's fine. Um, you would also agree with this man, Mark Emmert, um, saying that they're students first and all that stuff. And I hope that after this presentation, you can see that, you know, the argument is not as black and white as that. Is that there are many gray areas in the subject where we need to start looking more at the quality of the education and you know the the money aspect is so different than it was when the NCAA was created in the 1950s that changes in the air all right thank you uh, thank you Alex you guys can check out